Hello and welcome to After Scientology, Straight Up and Vertical, the weekly show where Tony Ortega and I review the last week's events in Scientology as reported on Tony's Substack. Hey, Tony, welcome back. Thank you, Chris. As you can see, I'm back home now. I'm no longer in a Rhode Island motel. Yay. <laughs> how, was the, how was the trip overall? Did you have fun? Yeah, you know, it was great. I, I rode my bike to Boston. I've, I've wanted to do that for a long time. It took me four days and I had to go through some rain, but... Uh, I love pulling into Boston, and then I had dinner with Ron Newman. I don't know if that name means much to you, but, you know, there was this scene back in the 90s where Scientology and the Internet was just this wild war. Yeah. And, of course, there are many familiar names from that period, and one of them is Ron Newman, who was one of the folks that was trying to expose what Scientology was doing as far as, you know, trying to shut down uh, free speech on the Internet and that kind of thing. So it was really great to finally get a chance to sit down and have a nice meal with him that was kind of the culmination of my little trip awesome awesome that sounds nice yeah those were crazy times the old ars uh alt religion scientology days the message board days that was uh we don't talk about that period a lot but it really a whole documentary could be done about it it's there's a lot there uh miss bloody butt <laughs> oh my god the stories from that time <laughs> oh man um Okay, well, on your Substack this week, there were a few few stories worth commenting on. They were quite interesting, and um, one of them I thought we might lead with was Steve Kinane's the judgment uh, on a lawsuit in Australia against author Steve Kinane, who had written this uh, probably one of the best books on Scientology ever. Yeah. Uh, you want to break this down? Yeah, because it, it's confusing because it's that it's not Scientology suing Steve. Yeah, Steve Steve wrote the definitive book about Scientology in Australia, and what I like about it so much is there are things that Hubbard got up to in Australia that help explain the whole Scientology evolution since then. Um, you know, he he got in some trouble there, and the way he solved it then sort of set a precedent. For what they're doing today mm. and so you know uh steve really did a great job putting that all together i really enjoy his book and you know chapter after chapter is just about scientology's controversy scientology's abuses but in one chapter steve decided to throw scientology a bone and point out that you know they hate psychiatry so much because of l ron hubbard's history that they will, you know, they like to investigate psychiatrists, psychologists, that kind of thing. And they actually helped blow the whistle on this psychiatric hospital called Chelmsford, where there was this horrific treatment going on, where the psychiatrists were experimenting with drugging patients to get them into a very, very, very deep sleep. It's called deep sleep therapy but they were drugging them so much it was killing them. Mm -hmm. They were going to sleep and not waking up, Chris. That's right. And so it finally became this massive scandal, in part thanks to Scientology getting in there and reporting on it. So Steve just wanted to point out that, hey, that's part of the history of Scientology in Australia. Well, in the process of doing that, he named some doctors and administrators at that hospital who had been investigated back then by a royal commission a government investigative body, right? And, you know, that's what you do when you're a reporter. You look up the old records, you cite them. There's no, nobody's saying he didn't cite them correctly, but Australia doesn't have a First Amendment. And so two of these figures, I think one was an actual doctor, one was an administrator, I'm not 100% sure, sued Steve Kinane and his book for defamation. In the United States, that wouldn't go anywhere. You'd just say, look, you know, the things I said about these people come from a government report you can't you can't sue a journalist over that yeah. even if they don't like what's in the government report but in australia they decided that the journalist doesn't have any protection and so the book company and canane were going to have to go into court and prove that this stuff happened all over again it would be like chris if i wrote a book about watergate citing you know actual white house records and, you know, from 50 years ago and somebody coming from forward from that period saying, no, that didn't happen. You defamed me. And I would have to go back in court and prove that it all happened. Exactly. I mean, it's just so insane. It would never happen in this country. So there was this trial and I actually got to watch a lot of it because Australia is much better about allowing uh, court observers to watch online. 
And one after another, experts were put on by Steve's book company and just said, yeah, these doctors did these horrible things. And yeah, all these people died. And yeah, what the Royal Commission said was true. And what Steve said about them was true. And the judge, you know, found that, yeah, you didn't, def- Steve Kinane did not defame these people. He was just reporting what was said back then. And she found for the book company. Well, they appealed. And a higher court found that it was unfair that the original finders of fact could not be cross-examined because they're dead. I mean, it's Australia. What's going on with you? And so after years of all this pretrial stuff, the trial, the appeal, HarperCollins was faced with another trial, and they'd already spent millions, and they decided to settle. And so I first saw notice of the settlement in The Guardian. And my first reaction was, okay, thank goodness. I know that's been a headache for Steve Kinane personally. I'm glad that's all over. But then the more I read about it, it was saying that Harper Collins was apologizing that of the two people who sued, one has died. So the guy that's still alive, they're apologizing to him and uh, retracting certain allegations. And also what, what really struck me was the Guardian article said that Steve Kinane would not be allowed to give a statement. And I thought, oh, my. Well, you know, Steve's a friend of mine. I contacted him and I said, I can't believe this is going on. And he's in Europe now, uh, reporting for an Australian news service, but in Europe. And he gave me a statement. And I I'm, I was really happy to publish that statement. He's never apologized for what he, he did. He stands by the reporting he did. And why not? He was just reporting from a royal commission. So I, I really feel for him that he's had to go through all this and his publisher has kind of, uh, you know, thrown up, put up the white flag at this point. And this horrible person, I'm not going to name them, this horrible person who was part of this just awful treatment of people back in the 80s and 90s is now acting like he's been vindicated. And it's right. just not the case. Right. So I know, it, you know, it's a great book about Scientology. The controversy is not really about Scientology. But Steve Kinane, I think, is an important figure to a lot of us in this field. He's done some fantastic work over the years, not just that book, but his work on Australian television. Some of the people who first, Valeska Paris, the first person she talked to publicly was Steve Kinane. Um, uh, Joe Reish, you know, I mean, Steve did amazing things. And uh, I just hate to see him treated like this. And uh, I, I was grateful that he gave the Underground Bunker a statement that, you know, nobody else got to see. Yeah, no, it was great. It was a great story and very, very confusing how there, how that higher court could have seen things that way and reversed it. I, I all I can say is Australia. Yeah, what the hell's going on down there? That is a, well. That I mean, what's weird. what's a what's a reporter supposed to do if they want to write something about World War One that's critical of somebody? Exactly. That's crazy. Yeah, you know, that's crazy. How, how 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 are you gonna survive? I don't know. It's, I guess all those people are dead, so they they you can defame them, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's nuts. Um, I there's a lot of controversy, and I've discussed it at length on my podcasts about the First Amendment in the United States. But this should not be a controversial thing. I, I mean, the, the, they should put something in place in Australia because clearly it's needed. Um, now moving on to our next topic. And this one, uh, okay, I got this is good because um, I I have done movie reviews on my channel. I have done even a movie review channel for a while, right? Which came and went. I remember. Love yeah. doing it, right? And I yeah. and love movies, always have. Well, it, this has to be. Uh, this is the second time now because uh, this guy from AV Club that Luke you have Thompson. on, Luke Thompson, um, has got to be one of the best writers of movie reviews I have ever seen. And I have read thousands of them. Um, and this po- and both of them have been posted on your Substack. There was the one about Maverick and then this one this week about um, the new um, Mission Impossible movie. Uh, and, you, and you ended up doing a podcast with him. Is that right? Right. Or- yeah, uh, Luke and I were at a newspaper together back in the late 90s in Los Angeles that no longer exists, and that's when we first met, and he was just starting out his career. I was I was a few years into mine, and we became friends, and then um, he, I've always, I've always respected the fact that Luke 
doesn't care what anybody else thinks about a movie. He's going to go his own way. And so, for example, when Battlefield Earth came out, he was one of two or three critics in the country that actually liked it. So I like that about him because, you know, he's his uh, he, he's, he t- tells things the way he sees it, you know. And so last year he had told me that he was getting a screening of Top Gun Maverick, but he didn't really have a place to put a review. And I said, hey, can the bunker have it, you know. So um, I commissioned that and he he went and he and he saw the movie. And believe me, I didn't know what I was going to get. He might have loved that film. Right. But um he was probably the harshest critic of that movie in the country. And and he specifically located his criticism in the way uh, Cruz plays such a narcissistic figure. And um, I thought it was great. It was, he had some hilarious lines in there. So now, you know, Cruz has got it. And, and listen, hey, the, mo- the movie made a ton of money. You know, uh, most critics liked it. That's fine. But, you know, Luke's take is, fa- is fascinating. So a year later, now um, this Mission Impossible 7 Part 1 is coming out. And Luke once again said, do you want another review? I said, absolutely. Again, I didn't know what I was going to get. And he did, I think you can tell, he did like this better than he liked Top Gun. But he still had some fascinating observations about Tom Cruise's character. Mm-hmm. You're, I mean, you're more of a movie buff than I am. What, did, what, did, what were some of the things you took away from the review? Well, I'll tell you, the thing that I thought was so good about this was the insight into the cultic parallels. And this is not something I guarantee you any other movie reviewer is going to be taking, where he draws, I'll just read just a little bit of this, because I love this line. He says, I called the Maverick character narcissistic Navy Jesus. And, uh, and he says, Hunt um, ditches the narcissism, but he's still a savior. And this is an analysis point of the movie, is like Hunt is the savior figure, and he's actually, uh, it feels like now more than ever, it feels like the impossible mission force is like a cult out to recruit people at their lowest moments. And I was like, mother, I mean, Jets, ex- that nails it especially when he follows that up with a line that the character says in the movie where I just, it was a total flashback for me to the Sea Org when I read this. Wow. It says here, Ethan makes the pitch to sexy pickpocket Grace. He tells her, your life will always matter more to me than my own. And she says, you don't even know me. And he says with rising music, what difference does that make? Right. And I just, I just literally, I was like, that's how I used to think and talk when I was in the Sea Org. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like, it's pitch perfect. So, um, you know, again, speaks to Tom Cruise's true believer uh, mentality. I think that this actually is a reflection of how he sees himself in the world. And I think this movie reviewer here, I think Luke nails it. I think he sees exactly what's going on for real. And puts it into a movie review without having to go into Scientology. He, he describes it in other terms that get the point across even better. And I, and mm. that's what I, I had. To, I was reading this and I was like, oh, I am definitely commenting on this one this week when we do our show. So uh, I thought this was brilliant. Yeah. And the other time I, I asked him for something was... Um when the Oscars were coming around is what February or early March is when that comes. Mm -hmm. Um, Top Gun was nominated uh, for best picture. And I started wondering, are, are, you know, you know, Tom Cruise was a producer on the film. Mm -hmm. So when, when something wins best picture, it's the producer who gets the Oscar and usually it's four or five people, whatever. But I started wondering what are the odds that we are going to see Tom Cruise get a trophy that night. And so I went to him and just said, can you handicap that for me? And so he, he not only talked about how that was probably unlikely uh, and he did predict who was going to get best picture, but he went through the whole list for us just to give us a, you know, cause he's so knowledgeable about all that stuff. And so I, th- I thought my readers appreciated it. I, you know, I did, I always, well, you know, Chris, you know how it is. You always hear complaints. Um, 
you know, three th- apparently 365 days a year of Scientology stories is not enough for some people. I know, to right? Do something <laughs> <that's>, uh, <laughs> can we can we just have one Saturday when we talk about movies and a podcast? Is that is that really a sacrilege? Anyway, uh, but I, I I just think I think Luke's great, and I'm so glad he's my friend, and uh, I hope I get to uh, call on him again in the future. Absolutely, I sure hope so because uh, he's he's good at his job. I, I'm I'm telling you. Um. All right. Now and he works so hard that that whole field, Chris, has been decimated. And anybody who's still writing movie reviews today, they are working so hard to put ends, you know, make ends meet. It's the whole thing has just been destroyed. Mm. Uh, that whole media sector. It's I know he he writes for about five different websites just to make a living. So I'm wow. always happy to you know, give him a commission at the, at the bunker. So I'm glad he's in there. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. He's, he's, he is good. Um, okay. And then we had, finally, we have more on the church of spiritual technology. And this was a part three, uh, from, uh, a writer uh, anonymous, I think. Yeah. Did they give their name? One of my readers, one yeah. of my readers just took it upon himself to, to do a lot of records gathering for us. And uh, I think we talked last time about how what was really interesting about part two was learning about some of these properties Mm -hmm. that I didn't really associate with CST and their values. So we get, we, you know, that, that see one of the things CST does besides the vaults, of course, we all know about the vaults. And if there's somebody watching that doesn't know the church of spiritual technology was created when Scientology reorganized corporate, its corporations in early 19, early eighties and CST's role began to create these underground vaults where L. Ron Hubbard's writings would be stored on media designed to last thousands of years. And they do that. They spend incredible amounts of money. But what this researcher was showing me is that CST also does some other things. They also, uh, this Heritage Properties is a subsidiary of theirs. And so what it does is buy L. Ron Hubbard's old homes to turn them into museums. And there were a couple of homes on that list that I wasn't really familiar with, and and we had their values. So it was really kind of fun to get that whole list together and put it in one place. This week's third uh, installment was more about the people involved Mm -hmm. and some of their patents, which I hadn't thought about. I don't know, just a fun accumulation of things. Uh, and, And I guess one thing that struck me was when he was going through the personnel of the people that were listed as officers of these various corporations, they're all getting up there in age, aren't they, uh, Chris? Yeah, that was the thing I noted was average age 61 for CST employees. And and uh, and Shelly, by the way, is, is getting up there. I mean, she is noted as uh, 60. She just turned 60, didn't she? 60, I think, on here, yeah. Or 61, is she now? 60, I, I, 61, yeah. So she, I think I she's mean, her 61. records are in here. So I I was like, oh, damn, I guess she is, isn't she? Because yeah. Miscavige, yeah. Uh, 63, I think, now. 63 or 64. Miscavige, Miscavige just turned 63 in April, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so, yeah, so it got me thinking because I couldn't help but wonder, and one of the things about these articles and this researcher especially has been so good at this is Scientology offers no transparency at all. I mean, the 1099s are the only thing we get as far as tax filings that are public records. We get, you know, there's very little else coming out of the church that we can see where we can see something behind the scenes. So when you get business records and actual like hard data, it's always like, Ooh, really? What does it say? And in this one, it got me thinking I, I, you know, another thing that's not transparent in Scientology are their census figures. What is the average age of a Scientologist now? What is the average age of a Sea Org member now? I wonder, because CST yeah. are like some old folks, and uh, and that's that's pretty interesting. Also interesting in this article were these patents because they have a lot to do with e-meters. All kinds of e-meter patents in here. Uh, over the last few years or something connected with e-meters. And I thought that was really interesting because they've definitely gone, as you mentioned, out of the vault business and into these other things they're doing, you know? So. Yeah, I don't know. Are they, I guess, I guess, you know, you got, when you're dealing with the high tech stuff like auditing, you got to keep up your uh, technology. Yeah, I guess. I mean, even these things are are back in two thousand four and six and eight. I think these have to do most with the um, with the new meter, 
the one they have out now, the eight. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that's what most of these right, are for. Probably, yeah. Yeah. But these staff, I went through all of them. I don't know any of them. Uh, I didn't know any of them when I was in. Bolstad is a name. I think I worked with his brother. Um, there's a brother mentioned here, Bruce Bolstad, but I think there's another one. Okay. And uh, anyway, but other than that, most of these people are not are not people we would know. But the, well, I was uh, mm -hmm. Dylan Gill. Dylan Gill is the the one former CST person who's who's gone public and he's given numerous interviews. And I remember he was telling me that at one time that some of the CST people would go down to an event. There were, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, they would go down to the shrine for, you know, a, you know, but I don't think they do anymore. I think it's still kept super, super separate and secret. And most Scientologists never even hear about CST and never go to those places. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, especially with Shelly there, they, they have to be extremely careful about what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'll mention maybe one thing to say, Sea Org wise here is maybe their age might be in a way a uh, a flag of you know their trusted Sea Org members, their veteran Sea Org members. Generally, people aren't joining the Sea Org when they're fifty five. You know, these folks have probably been around in in Scientology for a very long time, and that's why they have that position. Because believe me, if there's any place in all of Scientology where trust is being placed in the people there, it's CST. Well, I remember Dylan saying that uh, they would only recruit couples anyway, because they expected you to be in there forever. Because oh, you, you know it's the most it's the most secret. Once they send you up there, you're never supposed to leave, and so they would always recruit them as couples. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, since they use couples to man the houses and vaults like out in Trementia and stuff. Right. Well, interesting, interesting. All right. Well, those were the things we were going to cover this week. So, uh, so good, good, great reporting on all that. Thank you for, for putting that all there. Any, uh, any sneak peek at what might be coming up? Yeah. I mean, I, I appreciate you, um, you know, bringing up these stories. It, it, it was the 4th of July week. I mean, there was definitely some slow days this week, but uh, things are heating up in litigation and I think by the time this comes out, I have a really fun update from Valerie Haney that I think people are going to find infuriating. Um, and um, some other stuff uh, I can't talk about, but it's going to be good this week, I think. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. All right. Good. All right, folks. Well, thank you very much for your viewership and support. Uh, obviously, sign up there on the address listed for Tony Substack. Uh, get your daily emails from him on that. And subscribe to this channel if you are not already. And with that, I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye.